thank you so much for having me beam in live from Chicago today. Um, and as Manish was saying, hey, I'm going to tell you about this lofty goal that I have of imagining all the people on a trustworthy internet. Um, so I work in the Department of Computer Science here at the University of Chicago, and I run the Air Lab. And my lab essentially, so in my lab, um, basically we really love the internet. I love the internet um, because I can actually beam in from Chicago to see you right now. I love that I can use it for communication. I love that I can use it for work or even entertainment. Um, and so in my lab, we've been really looking at how to help people manage different aspects of internet usage, whether that's around privacy and security, helping people to recognize misleading online content, or even to answer questions like, why is my internet really slow? Or why have I run out of data, right? So we cover performance and cost as well. Now today, I don't have time to tell you about all of these other things my lab does. Um, and so I just wanted to give you a quick idea of, of what we do and then go into the main uh, body of the talk. So we're very much a mixed methods lab. Um, we run user studies, we do web scraping, internet measurements. We also create tools that are user facing and we have a big focus on trying to impact consumer protection policy. Uh, like many of you there in Stanford uh, taking this HDI seminar, I follow user-centered design. So a lot of my work looks at trying to figure out what user needs are. We do designing prototypes, implementing and evaluating these prototypes. And theory also plays a large part in what we do. So in privacy and security, you know, I've looked at everything from user mental models of drones to online tracking. Um, try to help people with education and awareness around privacy and security, including for in-person novice protesters, for example. Um, again, today I'll be speaking a little bit about how we're trying to help people recognize misleading online content, like misinformation. Uh, well, not today, I won't be speaking about that, but that's one of the things we do. And then, like I said, we've built a number of tools to help people with managing internet speeds and, and data costs. So although my lab does all of these different things, um, today I wanted to focus on the reflections that I've had after almost a decade of work in these different spaces um, to try to think about how we can make the internet more inclusive and trustworthy. Now, why do I want the internet to be more inclusive? Um, well, you know, my lab is really focused on understanding what kinds of needs we would need to meet to have a trustworthy internet. And I noticed that not as many people do work in marginalized or on marginalized and underserved communities or looking through the lifespan of the human from when, you know, someone is very young to someone becoming an older adult. I also in my lab really want to focus on making the internet more trustworthy by identifying misleading online content online, as well as creating tools to help users evaluate misleading online content. So why do I care about all the people on the internet? Well, here's a very simple schematic I created. Since HCI started in the 80s, uh, basically all of the research tends to be on very homogenous populations. Far fewer of the HCI research studies that we, we see are actually on non-westernized or industrialized nations or on marginalized and underserved communities. And there's also far fewer studies or research across the lifespan of people. Um, so to better inform designs of tools, um, for privacy and security and a trustworthy internet, I feel it's really important that we start to look more broadly and get more research in this little light orange part of this uh, schematic. So why am I worried about trustworthy content? Well, I'm sure many of you over there, just like over here in Chicago, uh, especially during the pandemic, have encountered content online that's labeled as misleading, right? Um, but there are other types of misleading online content. Perhaps you've done online shopping and maybe you've been seeing interfaces where you're asked to sign up for a mailing list. And often you're presented with asymmetric visual choices where the thing that the provider wants you to sign up with is very prominent. And then you also have some sort of guilting, confirm shaming kind of language, which says, you know, do you want to sign up and save? So I sign up and get the coupon or do I click instead? Nah, I like paying full price. Similarly, on other aspects of the internet, like social media, there are people who are influencers who have lots and lots of followers, like here, DJ Khaled and his Instagram post. And he is not disclosing that he's actually having a sponsored post here. And he was taken to task for this because he has a really young following. And this was found to be, you know, like potentially having a negative effect on them. 
So we really need to inform internet policies and we need to help users critically evaluate content to protect from online malfeasance. So today I'm going to tell you about four different projects in my lab or four sets of projects in my lab that kind of touch on uh, you know, us, our sort of work to reach these goals. So first let's think about imagining all the people and let's in particular look at how um, privacy and security is managed by low income mobile users in South Africa. So the takeaway I want you to get here is basically, I want you to question assumptions about what our average users look like. So let's take a step back. So this is a set of studies we did in South Africa. If you know a lot about the country of Africa, I mean, the continent of Africa, you'll know it's not a country. There are actually 54 countries on the continent. Um, South Africa is just one of them at the very bottom. And the internet is really mobile there. When users get online, they tend to do so for the first time on a mobile device. Just to give you an example, um, a few years ago, I pulled a stat that shows that most of the mobile connect, uh, most of the internet connectivity is through mobile subscriptions and not fixed broadband uh, subscriptions. Also, data is really expensive there. So this is from an internet service provider called MTN. And you'll see that they say, oh, you know, different various pricing for different amounts of data. You can get 40 megabytes of data for about 10 Rand. That equates to about 60 US cents. But when we interviewed low-income mobile users there um, in the study that I'm going to tell you about, they were earning on average less than $4 a day. So 60 cents, which may not seem a lot, um, you know, just thinking about that number, actually becomes a huge amount of someone's income when they're very, very low income. So why look at privacy on social media in South Africa? You know, social media usage is on the rise globally, but like I was saying before, most studies on privacy in uh, social media and how we manage that tends to be on resource rich nations. And there are far fewer studies that are conducted in these resource poor settings. Um, and most of them focus on Facebook, but not necessarily in countries like South Africa. So we try to sort of fill this gap and set about trying to understand how users actually manage privacy on social media in this low income setting. This just shows you some of the pictures of the interview settings where we actually conducted some of our interviews. Just to give you, um, you know, a, a view as to how this differs from, say, where you're sitting um, in your lecture theater there in Stanford. So I just want to tell you a little bit about our methods. When we actually say we interviewed someone, generally we would come in, get their consent, ask them questions about social media usage, ask about themes that may touch on privacy and security without bringing those up explicitly, and then audio tape the interviews, compensate people, and then transcribe them before we go into data analysis. And I just want to tell you also about what were the kinds of people that participated in this study. So we had an even gender split of male and female identifying participants. Again, they were very low to lower income and they tended to skew towards a younger age range. And I just wanna tell you a couple of highlights of things that I found really interesting from this work. The first was unlike many people who are managing privacy on social media here in say the US, I found that most of the participants we spoke to didn't really consider privacy from the service provider, so someone like Facebook, as an issue. Typically, when they were mentioning privacy issues, it was to do with other people. And this often, a lot of the privacy issues stem from the fact that not many people are just using one person per device, but there's a lot of device sharing um, among this low-income group in South Africa. And so, for example, one participant was talking about privacy issues of how um, their girlfriend changed their password, accessed their Facebook, and read their messages. And so this came up again and again because device sharing is so much more prominent there. Another thing is um, Facebook, as some of you may know, I know it's been in the news a lot for many different things, but Facebook actually has quite a fine level of granularity in terms of its privacy settings. You can tweak and, and do quite a few things with it. But when we spoke to the users in South Africa, over half of them didn't even know that you could actually tweak these settings. They just assumed that on Facebook in particular, um, content had to be public by default. And so there was a much more heavy reliance on the concept of blocking someone in this all or none approach. Also, data costs actually limited people's ability to use privacy settings. 
Many of them, even if they did know privacy settings, said it was too expensive to sort of be clicking through all these different settings. And one example, uh, one of our participants actually had her account hacked and she abandoned the recovery process because she had to spend so much data to get an email recovery, asking her to reset her password and, and all these different steps. So eventually she just said, hey, I'm just, I'm, that account is gone. I'm going to create a new Facebook account. Also, unfortunately, South Africa is a country with a high crime rate. And so we really found that physical security affected people's privacy behaviors and how they actually interacted on social media. So many of the people that we spoke to told us about how often their phones or other devices were being stolen. And so they thought of social media as a data storage. Even though many of them felt that the posts had to be public, we found that a lot of them were telling us that they were uploading photos to Facebook so that if their phones got stolen, they would still have access to that data. Also, because of this concern for physical safety, people were mentioning things like seeing posts online, getting lured um, you know, by promises of job opportunities, getting lured to meet someone and then having something really bad like being robbed or worse happen to them. So they were very, very uh, cautious about posting in real time, which is unlike you know, what we're used to here in the States, people there thought very much more about whether they were posting something and who might see personal details. Like if you were posting a picture of kids, people told us they didn't want people to see the school uniform and know where their kids actually went to school. So it was very different to what we're used to thinking about when we think about average users in the States. So the major takeaway here is that really we have to question our assumptions about the average user's um, privacy needs. Not everyone knows about privacy settings. So even if they're really well designed or offer lots of different controls, that may not be making a difference to many different people who are on social media. Also, not everyone can afford to spend a lot of time setting up privacy settings. And people may have other concerns that affect their privacy and security. For example, having to upload your data publicly just because of physical security threats. So if we're trying to you know, reach this goal of imagining all the people on the internet, we really have to think about what that means and get more research on different types of populations and their privacy and security needs. So now that we've thought about different kinds of populations, let's think about imagining all the people in terms of the human lifespan. What happens when we really think about the youngest of internet users, kids? And so here, I'm going to tell you about a project that we had for the last five years on helping kids to learn about online privacy and security. And the takeaway I want you to get here is that we have to educate the youngest of our internet users. So let's take a look at why internet users um, are getting younger and, and why they might need some help. Play digger digger. Lata, play digger digger. Bobby, can you talk to play wheels? You want to hear a station for porn detected. Porno ringtone, no. hot chick, amateur girl, quality no, sexy. No, 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 no. Stop. Pussy oh. anal dildo ringtone. Alexa, stop. <laughs> okay, so that's just an example of as technology is becoming more ubiquitous, designers don't always understand that different types of users, like kids, may be interacting with them, and things can go wrong quite quickly. Yeah. So, yeah. oops. So, uh, coupled with that, you know, kids, especially recently, you know, with the pandemic starting, have had to experience a new norm. Just like I'm speaking to you in this sort of hybrid format, kids have had to deal with things like uninvited visitors Zoom bombing their calls, um, having to figure out how to do text chatting or etiquette around naming, backgrounds, turn taking, or even having to think about what happens to recordings of videos that are taken, about, uh, taken off them in the classroom. Also, there are many different security issues that have come about because of technology use in schools. For example, here in Chicago, late last year, the Chicago Public Schools District found that there was a bug in one of the software systems um, called GoGuardian, where teachers could actually initiate a call to a webcam and have it automatically answered without the student's consent, essentially giving them a view right into the student's webcam, wherever it was in the home. Luckily, they were able to detect this bug and they quickly shut it down. But because of these privacy and security issues, um, my collaborators and I started thinking about how do kids actually think about privacy and security? 
and what kinds of resources would they need to help learn how to manage online privacy and security. And there are many different stakeholders in this process. A child is not an island. A child has a parent, their teachers, and other stakeholders involved. So what we've been doing is we've been conducting interviews and focus groups with educators. So again, here, after the interviews, we usually go through a process of qualitative data analysis. So we might actually sit down and say, let's create a code book that encompasses all the different themes that we're looking for in a particular set of interview transcripts. For example, we might have a code that looks for what kinds of activities do children do on devices. And we might have subcodes like maybe they play games. We usually then take the transcripts and then we apply the codes or labels to those transcripts. And then once we have done that with all the transcripts and had numerous me uh, research meetings to discuss these transcripts, we group these codes into categories and we usually come up with the final themes that we then report in research presentations like this and in research papers. Now, I don't have time to go through all the themes that have come out of this work, but again, I want to give you some highlights. The first thing we learned regards parents. So parents often think of young kids because this research is focused on elementary school age kids between the ages of five to 11. They often think that young kids, even if they're online for remote school and so on, that they're not on social media, they're not really having to think about privacy and security until a later age. Similarly, um, not only are parents thinking, let's defer this to a later time, this kind of learning, they're often unsure of online privacy and security issues themselves. So they don't feel well qualified to teach kids about these issues. And so they are very dependent on this homeschool partnership. But now when we turn to teachers in the classroom, um, both during the pandemic as well as pre-pandemic, when we were speaking to teachers, they told us about the tech use in the classroom and thinking about technology as either just the means towards the learning outcomes or as means to actually keep students to task. So again, systems like Land School and Go Guardian, which are displayed here, each one of these little rectangles here and each one of these little rows are basically a student's laptop. And so students, um, and teachers basically have this window into what students are doing because they're trying to monitor them and keep them to, you know, on task for whatever the lesson plan is. They're also, especially in remote times, trying to see if a student's engaging. Are they logging on? Are they doing things like that? And so they're really considering online privacy and security. It's not a top priority. When privacy and security does come up in the classroom, it's typically around passwords. And for young kids who have little finger and don't have very good typing skills, as well as you know, are at the developmental age where maybe they're still learning how to spell and still learning how to read, it becomes very complicated with passwords. And so teachers are often getting kids to use passwords with personally identifiable information and writing them down on cards, which they then send home. So as you know, years later, we're often saying to people like us, do not do this. Do not ever write down your password on a piece of paper. And so kids are essentially learning poor online security hygiene um, and privacy hygiene. And then later on, they have to sort of unlearn these habits. So teachers don't really have time to incorporate this existing uh, kind of learning into curricula. And they have to deal with these developmental issues and also manage things like passwords and so on. So we took that learning and then we moved to the next step in the design process and said, OK, how do we actually start creating educational resources for kids? So some of you may know the game Doodle Jump. If you don't, it's this really addictive uh, platform game for your mobile phone where this cute little character sort of jumps up different platforms and you can earn points. So we imagined with child design partners this game called Privacy Doodle Jump. And we said, you know, given that privacy and security is so contextual, what if we could have this quiz that would expose kids to different scenarios where they'd have to manage privacy? For example, perhaps some websites asking them to input private data, and maybe we could give them encouraging messages if they sort of make better choices. And if they make poorer choices, we could kind of set them in the right direction. So we evaluated this with the child partners. And to sum up our efforts, um, one of our child partners said, I hate it when they take a perfectly good game and they try to make it educational. Right, so there's a very fine line between making something that's fun and engaging for kids and something that actually helps them learn about privacy and security. 
So despite this sort of disheartening comment, uh, we actually continued in this process. We took the feedback from our child design partners and we actually went ahead and made this mobile game called Cybernaut, which we also evaluated with kids. And with the feedback from this, as well as other resources like Choose Your Own Adventure Stories, we're starting to learn what kinds of things kids find useful and helpful and engaging um, and actually want to use to learn about privacy and security. So some of the things we've learned are that do's and don'ts are not effective for kids. They really need to know why they shouldn't do something. Like, why shouldn't I input that private information when someone's asking for it? Why shouldn't I tell someone my password um, if it's a stranger? Also, kids really need relatable everyday scenarios. So for example, if I was to have some sort of scenarios and, and do the same project in um, Stanford, you know, I might use things like, you know, stories about the Giants or things like that, as opposed to the Chicago Cubs, right? Because even those kinds of relatable everyday scenarios and touches on stories and context that kids are presented with really help them to relate to those concepts. And it sort of helps the learning take place. And then finally, kids really need this toolbox of strategies to help cope with the fact that privacy and security is very contextual. And so, you know, rather than just giving them a list of do's and don'ts, we need to give them lots of different kinds of things that they can do. For example, if they see something they don't understand, maybe one strategy is to ask a trusted grown up about what they should actually do. So the major takeaway here from this body of work so far is that we really have to educate the youngest of our internet users if we want to reach this goal of a trustworthy internet for all. And this doesn't just involve kids, but all their parents, teachers, as well as their caregivers. And more generally, privacy and security needs are not just limited to sort of adult users, but they span across the human lifespan. And so our lab is also starting to look at privacy and security needs for older adults as well. Finally, you know, kids are getting used to more kind of surveillance through GoGuardian, LandScore, and, and other kinds of technologies. So they're actually having changing notions of what privacy and security means. Already, we've tried to uh, you know, uh, work with the Federal Trade Commission through commenting and so on to help them understand how these kinds of things we're learning might uh, influence policies like the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, which actually regulates what data can be collected on kids. So now that I've told you a bit more about imagining all the people on a trustworthy internet, Let's focus in on how do we make a trustworthy internet? So now I want to give you um, a, an idea of a project that we've been doing on dark patterns and shopping websites. So here, the takeaway is, if we want to create a trustworthy internet, we first need to see what kinds of content is not trustworthy on the internet. So say I actually did want to come to Stanford today. Maybe I say, hey, I had such an amazing time at the seminar today. I want to take a flight this afternoon. What if I tried to book my flight? I might see a message like, hmm, there's only one ticket left at this price. And if you're like me, often when I'm booking flights, I think, is there really only one ticket left? Or is that just some sort of trick to get me to buy the flight? Well, as it turns out, some websites are trying to trick you. And they're using dark patterns to make you do things like that you may not have otherwise done, like book a, trek, uh, a trip to Stanford this afternoon, or even signing up for something. And more broadly, dark patterns are user interface design choices that coerce, steer, or deceive you into making a decision that if you were fully informed and presented with all the alternatives, you may not have otherwise made. So there are many different taxonomies of different kinds of dark patterns and I won't go into detail of all the different types of dark patterns that people have named, but this is really based on anecdotal evidence. Um, one of the dark patterns I actually showed you earlier is called confirm shaming. And that's where, again, people have asymmetric choices in the interface. So again, you can see the sign up and get coupon um, box is much more clear and easy to click on, whereas the, the nah, I like playing full price is sort of less visible. And then also there's that language which is trying to shame you into doing what the provider wants. Now, because there was just anecdotal evidence, we wanted to actually set about to see are dark patterns actually prevalent on the internet? And so we decided to look at dark patterns in shopping because users have to make a decision to purchase something. 
So we set about and we gathered a corpus of 11,000 of the most popular shopping websites online. And we had some challenges we had to deal with. For example, we had to mimic a real user browsing the shopping website. We had to then collect and store the data from all these shopping websites. And then we had to actually analyze that data to see if there were dark patterns present. So just to give you an idea of how we address some of those challenges, um, for the first challenge, we created a shopping bot. So our shopping bot would actually visit each of the product pages or some a subset of project pages on each of those websites and would sort of mimic a user shopping. In this case, if I was on Macy's for shoes, our bot would actually try to choose different options for the colors, the sizes, and so on. And once it worked its way through many of the different options, it would actually add it to the cart and then go to the shopping cart web page. Since we didn't have a lot of cash, obviously we didn't purchase these products. And so our analysis stopped here. But at each of these points, we took screenshots and took um, screenshots of both pop-ups and all the visuals on each of the websites, um, as well as uh, did some other analysis. So as a lower bound, because our shopping bot and crawler did not look at every single page on every single shopping website we looked at, we are just saying that the patterns we found are kind of a lower bound. And we found that in those 11,000 shopping websites, at least 11% of them had some sort of dark patterns present. So I'm going to give you an example of some of these dark patterns. The first is a dark pattern called urgency. This is trying to create the sense that you really have to buy something now or you're going to miss out. And usually websites have been using this tactic of um, putting timers on their shopping websites. So if you've done online shopping, you may have seen this. Often a timer says, um, you know, it says something like an offer is about to expire or sales about to end or if you really want to get a discount that you have to do it within a specified amount of time. So not only did we see that this was prevalent across our data set, but we also noticed that in cases where we were revisiting the timers to see what happened when the timer expired, there was basic deception. So some of the timers just reset when they expired. And in other cases, the offer was still valid even when the timer expired. I already talked about the dark pattern of misdirection, which is trying to get you to do one thing. Um, and this dark pattern of confirmed shaming was actually quite prominent and prevalent across the websites. So here again, in the user interface design, you, the user is presented with visually asymmetric choices, as well as language that tries to guilt them into doing the thing the provider wants. So in this case, there's two examples here of, you know, would you like this 15% discount? You'd say, yes, I'd like that discount, or no thanks, I like paying full price. Or in this more, uh, you know, a little bit uh, more egregious example, no thanks, I'd rather pay the pay full price for things club. So the final dark pattern example I'll tell you about is a dark pattern called social proof. This is where the providers are trying to show you that other people are doing this as well, and you should get on the bandwagon. And so usually this typically, you know, one way this manifests is giving you activity notifications. So it might say something like Jacqueline from Jacksonville just saved $52 on her order. Or in other cases, it may say something like 28 people have viewed this in the last 24 hours or 28 people have this in their shopping cart. So not only did we see that this was prevalent, but we also found some deceptive as examples as well. In the most egregious example here, there's a site called threadup.com where we found that basically these notifications were just drawn from two sets of strings. And so it quite easily could have said, Sarah from San Francisco just saved $52 on her order. Not only did we see lots of different dark patterns on websites, but we also found there's a whole ecosystem that provides these kinds of dark patterns to shopping websites. So there are platforms where you can easily set up an online shopping website called Shopify, and there are many third-party plugins that allow you to do urgency, pressured selling, and these kinds of dark patterns as well. If you'd like to find out more about the other kinds of dark patterns that we found, um, you're welcome to visit this repository we have at Princeton, which is the institution I was at previously. So the major takeaway I want you to get from that study or that set of studies is that if you identify misleading online content, you really can inform policy and tools. Um, this large scale evidence 
is really useful for informing regulations and tool design. In fact, we've worked with the Federal Trade Commission to have discussions about what does it mean for a dark pattern to be dark? What is the line between um, something that is bad or something that's plain marketing, for example? And I'm happy to report that in California, um, they've already banned some kinds of dark patterns, particularly ones that relate to privacy. So the final sets of studies that I want to talk about are basically, if we want to create a trustworthy internet, it may not be enough to have data sets of what could be considered misleading online content. How do we actually take that content or take what we've learned and create user-facing tools? So the takeaway here, I want you to understand that, yes, we can create user-facing tools to help people recognize misleading online content. And I'm going to give you an example of how we did that. So I'm going to be talking about a project where we tried to help people recognize disguised advertisements on social media. But first, and I'll give a trigger warning here, this camera angle here is a little bit shaky, but this is an influencer. So let's take a look at an influencer on YouTube. When I was a kid, all I ever wanted to be was a YouTuber. All I ever did was make videos. Hey, who's this? Oh, it's me. Funny enough, I was actually voted most likely to be a YouTuber in high school. And after I graduated, I made a promise to myself that I was going to do it. OK, so that is an influencer, someone who has a lot of different followers on social media. In this case, her name is Elle of the Mills. Um, this is a video that I pulled a while ago from her website. Uh, or her channel on YouTube. She had 1.6 million subscribers. The video alone had 1.9 million views. And in this video, Elle is talking about how she was having a nervous breakdown and how using a service called betterhelp.com, which is kind of like a counseling service that hooks you up with different uh, therapists, really helped her to work through these issues. What Elle does not tell you in the video description, that's this text below the video, is that every time someone signs up, betterhelp.com using her link or even clicks on that link, she actually earns a bit of money. And this is called affiliate marketing. And importantly, Elle does not disclose that she's earning money from giving you this information about this service. However, the Federal Trade Commission, which oversees the consumer protections on the internet, says that if there's a connection between someone like Elle and a marketer like betterhelp.com, that you need to disclose that relationship. Otherwise, it's considered deceptive advertising. And so companies can actually be taken to task for this um, if they're not disclosing. And similarly, influencers have to disclose uh, when they have these kinds of connections. So we wanted to first find out again, is this a problem? Do people do affiliate marketing and how many of them are actually disclosing? So we again gathered a data set of half a million view, uh, videos on YouTube, as well as two million, 2 million pins. And we looked and, at all the video descriptions and all the pin descriptions and tried to find all the URLs in those descriptions. Out of the URL data set, we started to notice a pattern for affiliate marketing link URLs. We noticed that when there's an affiliate marketing link URL, the marketer like betterhelp.com needs to know or have an identifier for the influencer, in this case, L. And so typically in the URL itself, they have some sort of identifier for the influencer that is doing the referrals. And this pattern holds for all different kinds of affiliate marketing links. Sometimes it's you know, as simple as the L parameter that I showed you, but sometimes it's actually in the URL parameters itself. And we can use this key uh, observation to actually map out what are the different types of affiliate marketing link companies, uh, affiliate marketing companies, as well as what are the different patterns these companies use. So one of the biggest affiliate marketing companies is one that you probably know well, it's amazon.com. So next, now that we know, you know, we can actually detect affiliate marketing links, we started to look at the description. So again, recall this is something that you usually have to click through, that's the lower video on YouTube. And we looked at the uh, Pinterest descriptions to see you know, we wanted to first find out how common is it that if someone is doing affiliate marketing like L of the Mills, that they actually disclose that they're doing this. And if, you know, unsurprisingly, or maybe surprisingly, that only 10% of these affiliate marketing videos and 7% of the affiliate marketing pins on Pinterest actually had any sort of disclosure that the influencers were doing affiliate marketing. And we examined these and categorized them into three broad types of disclosures. 
The first is something that we termed an affiliate link disclosure, where an influencer might say something like, affiliate links may be present. Now, the Federal Trade Commission actually explicitly discourages this because, you know, if you were like me before this project, I didn't even know what affiliate marketing was. And so they, you know, don't want people to have just such a basic disclosure. The second kind of disclosure we noticed was what we called an explanation disclosure, where a person tries a little harder to say that they're earning money. And so they might say something like, this is an affiliate link and I receive a commission for the sales. The final type is just something where we noticed on YouTube that people often say, click on this link and you'll support my YouTube channel. Now, not only uh, is it not that common to actually disclose when you're doing affiliate marketing, uh, at least from our data set, it's also the fact that the most common kinds of disclosures that we found were the very basic affiliate link disclosures that the Federal Trade Commission um, discourages. So now that we know that this is actually something that isn't being disclosed, we actually moved to try to create a tool. Before and to inform the design of the tool, we first wanted to know, do users actually understand these different types of disclosures? So we ran an experiment on Mechanical Turk where we exposed users to different types of disclosures and we saw which ones they understood the most. As it turns out, users understand explanation disclosures the most, and affiliate link disclosures are, as we suspected, not as easy to understand. We then took this information and we actually incorporated it into a tool. So our tool is called Ad Intuition. It's a browser extension that we developed for Chrome and Firefox. And Ad Intuition works by loading the YouTube video, checking the links in the video description, and seeing if they're affiliate marketing links or promotion codes. And then if so, putting up a minimally intrusive banner that lets you know when something's sponsored. And in addition to that, it also highlights the links and promotion codes in the video descriptions. We ran a study um, with uh, over 300 users in the wild to see if the tool worked and it did do um, classification and detection uh, very well in the wild. We also conducted a diary study and found that it was very helpful for users to have this tool because in many cases they were watching influencers who they did not know were doing affiliate marketing or in some cases that they suspected were doing affiliate marketing and had confirmation of that. So this tool really did help people to understand and become a little bit more aware of the fact that influencers can be engaged in this practice. And that tool, although it's a browser extension, could arguably be built into the browser itself. So the major takeaway here is that user-facing tools can help users to identify misleading online content. And these kinds of tools are useful for creating a more trustworthy internet. It also informs internet policy. For example, through the tool, as opposed to our random, randomly um, collected data set of YouTube videos, we were actually able to see how users watch videos in the wild. One thing I found surprising, or maybe not surprising in retrospect, is that a lot of users tend to watch the same influences over and over again. And so that means that they either are, you know, there might be some users that are disproportionately exposed to affiliate marketing. As a random aside, a uh, fun tidbit, PewDiePie, who was um, at the time of this research, one of the biggest influencers on YouTube. Um, when I pulled this video, he had 83 million subscribers and this video alone had 4 million views. Uh, when our work got some press, he actually started using the basic affiliate link type disclosures. So again, um, much like my other work, we've tried to uh, distill our findings and help you know, give presentations to the Federal Trade Commission and help them with commenting on the online endorsement guidelines to help influence the policies around this. So I want to close by saying, you know, imagining all the people on a trustworthy internet, you know, I hope today I've also helped you think and question your assumptions about what the average internet user's needs are. Uh, I hope I've convinced you that we need to educate the youngest of internet users about privacy and security, that we do need to identify what other types of misleading online content exists online, as well as work to create tools to help people to critically evaluate this content. And so just as a reminder, my lab is working on all of these different things, um, and I'd love to take questions now. Thank you so much. We have time for questions. so. Oh, okay, great. Um, maybe, uh... um, how 
do you kind of find a balance between regulating internet use and making it um, private enough and safe enough for people to use without encroaching too much on freedom of speech and behavior online? Oh, that's probably, uh, I, I think I probably need a few dissertations worth of uh, time to answer that question fully. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think it is a fine line. Um, even when it comes to identifying misleading online content, it's not straightforward. For example, even with something like labeling a video as a sponsored video became tricky. If we weren't sure if our detection was working accurately or like when we were looking at promotion codes, um, we tried to use different colors and different messaging to say when we weren't certain about something. So almost like saying, hmm, this might be sponsored, but it may not be. So I feel like, yes, you could have cases where um, the way you're regulating or the way you're flagging something can actually affect or be used or misused to censor someone. Uh, but I still think that there's some basic privacy protections that we can put in in terms of regulation to incentivize providers to do the right thing when it comes to privacy, right? So I don't think there's a there's an answer I can give you quickly now in this talk, um, but I think it's a very good question. Uh, I have a question about uh, your slide lessons learned uh, relating to kids and privacy. Yes. The the various bullet points I I resonated with them personally a lot, and so to me like it could have been lessons learned you know relating to adults. Um, yes. Are there are there differences that you found um, beyond uh -huh. those bullet points, or is this something that that you also feel? Or are the difference really differences in how we should address kids and adults? Because I find oftentimes we is, we expect there to be a difference, only to find that there's not that much difference. Yes, I'm glad you said that. Um, and I'd say no. Actually, many of the things that we're doing for kids could work just as easily for adults, um, or even older adults. Um, so I think that you know many adults struggle with privacy and security issues and don't know how to manage these things. I think the main difference when we're coming to situ uh, like designing for kids is that we try to, because of the developmental age, because of the physical differences and so on, we do have to design things that are more specific to that age range, um, even though we may be trying to address the same issues. So for example, one project we had was, um, you know, which I, I don't have any write up on, was we tried to make something that would help kids understand online tracking and so we built a tracker, a blocker, sorry, um, a browser extension that would turn all the trackers on a web page into little aliens and visualize them so that kids could see that things were watching them. All right. So that could be fun for an adult, but I feel like certain things might be more engaging for a child just because of the age that they're in. And so mostly when we're thinking about it, although the issues may be similar, you know, the kinds of designs that we create are very much focused on children. And if we were thinking about older adults or adults, we would maybe have the same kind of learning behind it, but we might change the designs to suit the different age groups. Thank you. Other questions? Do we get questions online? Yeah, they have to just put the raise in their hand feature, and okay. then I can unmute them. But right now, we don't have any okay. questions. Great. Yeah, oh, question over here. Yeah, I was wondering when you had this slide discussing how I think it was the FTC or one of the government bodies had to mandate kind of like the sponsored um, notification for users. I was wondering from like a policy standpoint and as a technologist working hand in hand with people in government, like how long did it take to um, get that put in place? Right. So I, you were sort of cutting out a little bit. I think you were asking about how how do you get that sort of influence with your work with the Federal Trade Commission? Did I get that right? Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, I was just fortunate that um, I was, I happened to sort of meet and connect with some folks that were in the Federal Trade Commission. So I think that that helped a lot. Um, basically in my work so far, both when I was living in DC, as well as since I've been away from there, um, is that oftentimes it's very much like personal, sorry, that's my timer to make sure I didn't go over time. Um, it's very much personal relationships that help you to kind of uh, get your work seen and, and heard about by the right people. And once you have those personal relationships, then it becomes much easier to say, 
hey, I have this kind of study, which I think, you know, really relates to this regulatory issue that you're working on, or vice versa, where they could say, we have this issue that we need evidence on, you know, is there any research in this, or are you working on this, and so on. So I feel like, just like with many other things in academia, that a lot of this stuff seems to be, you know, uh, personal relationships, and it did help, I think, initially for me to be located in D.C., where I was closer and was able to meet more people. Uh, but a lot of the stuff is just like through networking. Hello, uh, thank you for the great talk. I was curious about um, related to the first part of your presentation on uh, how people interact with the internet in uh, especially low income um, neighborhoods or countries. Um, so in the US, we have the FTC to as a governing body for uh, some types of uh, media interaction. How have you found kind of government or governing uh, the internet to be in um, developing nations compared to the FTC? Right. Is a different interaction? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I, so in South Africa, um, there is like, there are similar sort of governing bodies, but I'd say um, in some cases they're ahead of certain things, like in terms of privacy, and in other cases they're behind just because the infrastructure isn't as well developed. Um, so I feel like, it's 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 not always the case that like you know one country is like very well developed than another and, and I think it just depends on the context. For example, I know South Africa says that it's not legal to spread misinformation, um, but that's because they've had a lot of issues around misinformation being spread around elections, right? So um, and I'm not sure we have the same thing here. So I feel like working there, um, it's much it's very similar. Like at the end of the day, we're all people. So again. <laughs> It's about like, uh, you know, I was again fortunate to work with an, a nonprofit there when I was living in South Africa and doing like an internship there. And so, um, or a postdoc there. And um, I feel like, you know, again, a lot of this stuff is just about trying to get your message to the right people so that you can affect change. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and I see a question. Um, yes. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, because I think your work is really special because you interact with both like the uh, legal and like policy making side of um, people and also um, the academia people. What would be some like, what is like some key difference or did you find any key difference in um, communicating your work in, uh, with like um, people who are on the policy maker side? Uh, rather than people in academia, and yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think both in this case and also just working across disciplines in general, um, it's always about finding how you can translate what you know into terms that the other person or other sets of people understand. So just, it's the same with policymakers. It's like, you have to learn the terms that they use and then try to make sure that you're, you're getting on the same page. Um, oftentimes, you know, this means you can't necessarily dive deep into something that you find really exciting about like some technical detail, but it's more about like giving, you know, the higher level takeaway. And sometimes, you know, the kinds of questions that a policymaker might ask sort of shows you that they may not understand what's technically possible. So it's up to us as computer scientists to say, okay, here's what's technically possible so that they can then understand how to write the regulation to support things that are actually possible. So for example, um, I know in the EU, uh, we were speaking to some folks here in the law school who are saying that uh, they are trying to do, do put in legislation where humans have, or people on social media have um, like access to a human decision maker, right? When they are say kicked off a platform or something like that. And so again, one of the things we don't know is like, how easy is it to do that? Like how easy is it to have an automated system that detects when someone should be kicked off? And then how easy is it to have someone, you know, appeal and then have a decision maker actually come in and, and, and do something about it? And so if you don't have like a strong connection between the technology and the policymakers, then the regulations are not going to be written in a way that can actually be implemented and executed. And so that's why I think it's really important to have these dialogues. But Again, it's really about trying to figure this out over time um, and figuring out how to speak the language of the, the other side, so to speak, or to get a shared language, I should say. I see. Thank you for your answer. That, yeah, that's, that makes a lot of sense. Hey. 
I have a question. Um, so uh, the, the work on dark patterns was very interesting. One low level question I had about that is how did you detect all of the dark patterns? Was, was that done by code or did you have people look at all the, all the sites or how did that work? Yeah. Um, that's a very good question. So um, basically, you know, once we had scraped all the data, we used um, hierarchical clustering to cluster all the kind of textual parts of all the screenshots into different buckets. And then we um, had like expert reviewers, you know, in this case, the student led the work and um, some other collaborators basically go through the data and qualitatively like code it. And then, you know, from that, actually start to figure out like what were the common things. But we had before that looked at all the different taxonomies and all of the kind of anecdotal evidence. So in some cases we had some ideas of what things might be problematic um, and it was easier to identify those. But in other cases, you know, we had to kind of see what we were seeing that was common and then kind of try to put a name to it. And, and maybe a higher level question about that. Uh... You know, so these dark patterns can be used for purposes that are that are not so great. <laughs> um, but you can also imagine people trying to use these patterns to nudge uh, consumers and, and people to doing things that are good for them. <laughs> and yes. I wonder if uh, if you could just speak to that and, uh, you know, how should we think about differentiating between good uses of these patterns and, and negative uses? Right. So um, I, that's an excellent question. And I'll point you to a research paper by Arunesh Martha, who is uh, the former student who led this work, who's now actually going to be working at a regulatory body in the UK for a while. And um, he wrote a paper that's, you know, basically what makes a dark pattern dark? Because I guess like the fundamental question that's not easy to answer is when is a manipulation problematic and when is it actually doing something that's maybe not that harmful or, or, you know, how do we define harm even? Like, is that financial loss for someone? Is that mental health issues? Um, is that, you know, maybe someone just got something extra in their cart, but they didn't actually purchase it. Um, and I think it's not that easy to draw that line. And as you pointed out, um, you know, nudging people has also been used to kind of get people to opt into insurance plans and things like that by having pre-checked boxes, right? Instead of opting into something, you have to opt out. And so I feel like there's a lot of research going on into how these different types of interfaces can be problematic, but perhaps one area of research that we have less to say about is, um, you know, how are like these kinds of manipulations actually not problematic? So how are some patterns good and nudging people in a good direction. And so I, I think there's less in that space. Great, thank you. All right, well, thank you very much for that wonderful talk, Marshni. And um, I think we should finish for the day. Okay, awesome. Well thank you so much. I, I, you know, like, I can't see who's in the room, but, um, you know, very excited to beam in and I thank you for the opportunity and I hope you all have a nice day over there in California. <laughs>